lot to go over today. Um, we have an amalgamation of things, scriptures, pictures, quotes, and charts. First week, we went over why should we defend the faith. Because if you don't know why, there's, there's no reason to go any further. The why is the key answer to everything. Why? And I kind of basically told you that every Christian, every believer should know what they believe, why they believe it, how to share it with others, and how to defend it. Simple. What you believe, you got to know what you believe, you got to know why you believe it, you got to be able to share it, and you got to be able to defend it. And we went over that. That's in week one, and you know it's, it's, it's somewhere on the internet. I don't know where it is, but somebody could help you find it. Um, and then week two, we basically went over um, internal and external evidence. Very important. What the document actually says, and then what other historical documents, how they corroborate what the Word of God says. And then this week we're going to go over um, bibliographical evidence. And then week four and five is my favorite. I can't wait to get to it. It's prophetic evidence. It's the phenomena. You know, it's the evidence that no other history book has. Every history book has history. Our history book has prophecy. Over 8,000 scriptures of prophecy. And that's my favorite because that's all God. You know, it's not just facts and figures. It's just God's power. And I love God's power. That's in a league of its own. So I'm pretty pumped. Um, let's, let me show you the first screen, which I've showed you the last few weeks. Um, Chauncey Sanders, as he's known as C. Sanders, he is probably the most renowned historian we have. And he's also a military historian as well as a military strategist. He wrote a book called Introduction and Research in English Literary History. And basically what he was trying to show is how do we know that a literary document is legit? If you write a biography, how do we know it's true? People read biographies all the time. How do you know what they're saying is true? You read a textbook. You read, don't even get me started on the internet. Some of you are just out of your minds. Do you know anybody can go on Wikipedia and change it? So how do we know? How do we know something is trustworthy? Can I trust my Bible? This is an important question. Now, some of you are like, I could care less. I have faith, Rabbi. I believe Jesus is the way to the Father. I'm going to heaven. Great. Good for you. You sound pretty selfish. God has given us so much, especially in this last century. They're finding things as I speak to you. I told you, everywhere you go in Israel, there's a zone that they're digging. The only thing they'll never find is Yeshua's bones. So we went over internal evidence, what the document says. We went over external evidence, how the document aligns up with facts, dates, and persons. Because, I mean, there's tens of thousands of steels and, and, and tablets that corroborate names in the Bible, times, Battles. Just, it's, it's, it's crazy how much evidence. It's crazy how much external evidence. There's no other book or volumes of books that have the evidence that we have for our Bible. And when a person says, oh, it's written by men, they are proving to be the, you know how there's the Song of Songs and the Lord of Lords? They are the buffoon of buffoons. They're saying that, and what they're saying, what they're saying is, I am an ignorant moron. I am ignoring the truth. And I choose to make this idiotic statement without any scholarship. And the sad part is, some of your most intelligent people say it. Just goes to show you, you can be an intelligent moron. Anybody met any? Okay, so today we're going to go over bibliographical evidence. It's the, it's the strongest bit of evidence that this guy, C. Sanders, speaks about. It's the, this is the definition. It's the textual tradition from the original document to the copies and manuscripts we possess today. In other words, we don't have the original. We don't have the original Old Testament, New Testament. It's called the autographs. We don't have those. But what we do have is manuscripts, handwritten copies. So the fact of the matter is, when was the original event? When was the manuscripts written? How many manuscripts do we have? Are they in agreement? And that's how you bring together 
bibliographical evidence, okay? This is going to be a little bit like class. Forgive me. Forgive me. But there are tons of places you can go and do rah-rah, sis, boom, ba, hear some great music with a black ceiling and go to lunch. And you won't be able to defend your faith. So, why don't we go to some scripture? So, the title is How Accurate Are Our Scriptures? We're going to do the Old Testament scriptures first and then finish with the New Testament. How was the original Bible compiled? It's a good question. I don't think anybody ever asked it. How was it compiled? Its assemblage can be traced through scripture in a very fairly accurate manner. For instance, we have Exodus 24.4. Moses wrote down all the words of Adonai. Oh, how did he write it? Do you know that writing has been around since 3000 BC? Do you know they use reeds with ink and they wrote? On papyrus, writing didn't start like a few years ago. It's been around for a long time. Everybody thinks Moses just took a chisel and just no. Fred Flintstone did that. <laughs> Not Moses the prophet. Okay, now he it says in the Bible that he wrote down the words of Adonai, and this is just one of three references. Three is a very important number. If you're taking notes in Exodus 17, 14, and Exodus 34, 28, respectively, it says the same thing. So, Moses wrote the Torah of God. He wrote it down. Okay, it was written. Look at Deuteronomy 31, 24, 26. It says, Moses kept writing the words of this Torah in a book until he was done. When he had finished, Moses gave these orders to the Levim, the Levites, who carried the Ark with the Covenant of Adonai. They carried the Ark of the Covenant. He said, take this book of the Torah and put it next to the ark with the covenant of Adonai, your God, so that it can be there to witness against you. So the tablets, the tablets of the Ten Commandments were placed inside the ark. The book of the law was placed alongside the ark. You got it? Like, like, just to give you an idea. So this would be like the Ark of the Covenant, and here is the rest of the Book of the Law. It's in there. It was next to it. Okay? That's what our Bible says. Look at John. This is astounding. Look at John 5, 46, 47. Now this is, this is an accusation that Yeshua is making to his Jewish contingent. He says... For if you believed, really believed Moshe, what do you mean Moshe? Then they weren't around when Moshe was around. What's Moshe? It's synonymous with the Torah. When you hear Moshe, it's the Torah, the five books. He said, if you really believed those five books, like you say you do, you would believe me. Because guess what? It was about me that he wrote. It was all pointing to me. But if you don't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Now, this is astounding on a few different levels. First of all, let me give you the interpretation. Genuine believers have a heart that is receptive to the true words of God. Genuine believers. And therefore, those who believe the words of God is written by Moses, Genesis, Deuteronomy, will also recognize and eagerly receive the words spoken by Yeshua. Now, we do it opposite. Christians do it opposite. It's like they started John. What happened to the rest of the Bible? Is that what you do? Do you go to the movies and go, did this start already? Oh, it didn't? Okay, I'll come back in an hour and 15 minutes. I just want to catch the last 15 minutes of the movie. Why do you do that with the Bible, knucklehead? It's the foundation of the Bible. All the prophecy there. Without the prophecies, all you got is some guy saying, it's me. You got no proof. The whole point is it points to him. All roads in the Torah point to him. Without that, there's no pointing. You're like the scarecrow. You can go this way or this way. It's only one way. By the way, Yeshua put the writings of Moses on the same level of his own words.
don't you dare go, oh, this is the good part. It's the word of God, period. He's reminding us that all scripture is God-breathed. Look at 1 Kings 8, 6. This is, how the, this is how the Old Testament was compiled. I think you should know. The Kohanim, the priests, brought the ark for the covenant of Adonai into its place inside the sanctuary of the house to the especially most holy place, right? You had the outer courtyard, which is kind of like where you guys are. You had the holy place, which is where the menorah and the table of showbread. And then you had the holy of holies. Some people call it the Kadosh HaKadoshim. Some people call it the most especially holy place. The bottom line, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the Word of God was, okay? So he said, bring it to the especially holy place under the wings of the cherubim, the cherubim. During the time of King David and King Solomon, the books already compiled were placed in the temple treasury and cared for by the priests who served in the temple. It was compiled, it was full, it was complete, it was there. But then there had to be more books added, right? Because we're talking a 1,000 B.C. What about after that? Weren't there other books compiled? When were they compiled? Let's go to Proverbs 25.1, shall we? These also are Proverbs of Solomon, meaning when people say these are David's, the, um, Proverbs of Solomon, the book of Proverbs written by Solomon. The men of Hezekiah, king of Jehudah, copied them out. They wrote what he said. More books were added during the reign of Hezekiah. That's 715, by the way, if you keep track, to 686 B.C. David's hymns, Solomon's Proverbs, prophetic books like Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. In general, as the prophet of God spoke, their words were written down, and what was recorded was included in what today is called the Old Testament. During the exile of the Jews in the 6th century, remember, 586 B.C., they were exiled to Babylon, <clears throat> the books were preserved. How do we know? Around 538 B.C., the Jewish people returned for the Babylonian exile, and Ezra the priest later handed other inspired works to the compilation. Nehemiah, Ezra. Look, I don't know if you know about the Jews and the Word of God. That's why the Torah is the most sacred thing they have. During the times of the Holocaust, when they were killing people, it was the rabbis who were burying the Torahs to protect them. They were putting the Torah before the life of their families. This Torah is a Holocaust survivor from Poland, authenticated. They would, always, they would always sacrifice for the word of God. And guess what? There are hundreds of thousands of Christians who have died because they wouldn't give up their Bible. The price that was paid for you and I to go to Walmart and buy a Bible is astounding. How one cannot cherish it is beyond me. So a copy of the Torah was stored in the most holy place of the second temple. When they came back and they built the second temple, they stored the copy of the Torah where the Ark of the Covenant used to sit. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was gone. Some people say Jeremiah hid it. Some people say it's under here, it's under there. I, I don't know how to say this nicely, but if you're spending time trying to find out where the Ark of the Covenant is, please let me slap you. If God wanted us to know, just like if he wanted us to know where Moses was buried, he would have told us. Everything we need to know is in the book. But we do know that a copy of the Torah was put in the most holy place. That we do know. Following a meticulous process, other copies of the Torah were made. Why? To protect and preserve the inspired writings. Copies. The collection of the Old Testament books written in the Hebrew language is what Judaism calls the Hebrew Bible. That's the Hebrew Bible, right? The Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. They don't recognize the New Testament. Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. In the 3rd century B.C., third, long time ago, okay, the Old Testament books were translated into Greek. So the Greeks can read the Old Testament by a team of 70 Jewish scholars. It's called the, in Roman numerals, LXX, or 70, or the Septuagint. Take a look at it. The Septuagint is just a Latin word 
derived from the phrase, quote, the translation of the 70 interpreters. I mean, that's legit. They took the actual Hebrew and just translated in Koine Greek. It's amazing. We have it. Man. Now, let me give you, we're going to talk about codices. Let me give you um, a definition of a codex, because if you don't know, you won't know, so I'm going to give it to you, okay? A codex is a set of manuscript pages held together by stitching. The earliest form of a book, basically it's a book. Bible, Biblios, is books stitched together, replacing the scrolls and wax tablets of earlier times. Okay? They weren't putting them on scrolls anymore. They were putting them in a manuscript form, a book, a codex. Okay? Has anybody heard of the Masoretic text? That was the only one I read in Hebrew school. Okay? The Masoretic text is not a particular codex. People think, oh, it's a codex, right? It's a set. No, it is not a manuscript. It's an umbrella term for what we consider to be the authoritative Jewish rabbinic text for the Tanakh, the Old Testament. So if you want to know what's the authoritative Jewish text for the Old Testament, it's called the Masoretic text. In the 6th century, a long time ago, a group of scholars called the Masoretes began to painstakingly keep track of what was to be the proper text of the Bible. Okay, let me tell you how they, how they work things, just to give you a little heads up. Again, I'm not a scholar. I don't propose to be a scholar. I will never be a scholar. But I could defend my faith. They kept rigorous notes in the margins, compared all the earliest manuscripts, okay? And due to their outstanding scholarship, brilliant, very quickly it became the absolute authoritative text of the Bible. Hang in there, guys. I know some of you are ready to fall asleep. You really got to wake the heck up. Okay? I know you're in the ball game. I never see you sleeping. Slap yourself, get some water, jump up, stand up, go against the wall, do something. The Masoretes included everything from the text itself to proper vocalization, vocalization of the, of the text, accents and plenary versus defective spelling. Plenary is complete. The Masoretes were very meticulous, crazy meticulous. They were professionally trained to copying documents. They're scribes. I've met scribes before. It takes a year to copy a Torah. A year. That's working eight hours a day. The Masoretes were so meticulous, they felt they were actually dealing with the words of God. Can you imagine that? So they were so, I mean, so respectful. For instance, if they were going to copy the book of Isaiah, the entire text were all capital letters, no punctuation of paragraphs. When they would finish the copy, they would total up the letters. Then they would find the middle letter of the book. If it was not the same, they junked it. They junked it and started a new copy. All of the present copies of the Hebrew text are in remarkable agreement. Total, total agreement. In the 10th century, the era of the Masoretes came to a close. They did this from the 6th to the 10th century, preserving the Bible, the Old Testament. They compiled all their research throughout the centuries into one single manuscript of the Bible. The year was 920, and a scholar named Shlomo ben Buya wrote a manuscript in true Masoretic tradition in the city of Tiberias, Israel, and it's known as the Aleppo Codex. Take a look. That was it. Amazing. Amazing. The crazy thing is, you translate that, and you grab a Bible from Walmart, says the same thing. I mean, guys, I don't know if you know how amazing it is. You listen to what I say, and in an hour at Chick-fil-A, you're saying something I didn't say. If you were to write it down, you have already changed it. That's an hour. These are centuries and centuries and centuries, and it's in remarkable agreement. The evidence demands a verdict. But I got one better for you. 1947, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's crazy, man. We're not talking 6th century. We're not talking even 3rd century B.C. with the Septuagint. We're talking 5th century B.C. What? Yep, Qumran in Israel. A lot of people wonder when we're on the way down to Masada why I don't stop there. Um, it's just some desert. I don't know exactly where they found it. And so to stop there and go, (laughs) 
Okay, get back on the bus. <laughs> Historians believe that Jewish scribes maintained the site to preserve God's word in Qumran and to protect the writings during the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. They took all these scrolls and hid them. They took them out of Jerusalem and brought them to Qumran. The Dead Sea Scrolls represent nearly every book of the Old Testament. See, people think it's fragments. No, sir. No, sir. Well, that's what I was told. Did you verify anything you're told? Well, I heard. You know when people say they read? 90% of them didn't read it. Every book, man. And comparisons with more recent manuscripts show them to be virtually identical. Fifth century BC to what you read today. What? The main deviations, and there are some, there are some, are spelling of some individual names and other insignificant differences. Rabbi, give me an example. I'm glad you asked. For instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls include a complete book of Isaiah. Now, you know Isaiah speaks more about the salvation than all the other prophets combined. Yeshiahu, his name is salvation. So it's a very important book. He's the prophet of prophets. When rabbinic scholars compared Isaiah chapter 53, which clearly speaks about the suffering servant, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? So you take in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah 53, 500 B.C. And then they compare it to the Masoretic text, right? Like 920, Aleppo. So you're talking 1,500 years later. Like I say, you can't get what I say right at lunch. 1,500 years later. They found only 17 letters that differed of the 166 words. Rabbi, my Bible doesn't have 166 words. Your Bible's written in English, sweet pea. This is Hebrew. There's 166 words in Isaiah 53. Ten of those letters, 17 letters, ten of them are merely spelling differences, such as honor, H-O-N-O-R, and honor, H-O-N-O-U-R. Is there any significant difference in that? Of course not. That's... 10 of the 17. Four, four, a minor difference such as as a conjunction. The word and, which is stylistic, not substantive. So we've got 10, four, three left. Three letters are a different spelling for the word light. In other words, the differences are totally negligible. Negligible. Therefore, we must come to the conclusion that there are no legitimate discrepancies in the text we read today. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a testimony. Isn't it interesting how like we found these Dead Sea Scrolls and then Israel was reborn? What a coincidence. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a testimony to the accuracy and preservation of the Old Testament and give us confidence that the Old Testament we have today is the same Old Testament used by Yeshua. In fact, in fact, Luke records a statement made by Yeshua regarding the assemblage of the Old Testament. Yeah. Luke 11, 49, 51. This is when he's chastising the prophets. You know what he says to them? The nice Jewish prophets. You're building tombs for the prophets your fathers killed. You killed all of them. Isaiah was sawed in half. Amos, you beat to death with a club. Zechariah, you stoned right in the temple. And now you know what you're going to do? You're going to kill me. So build the tombs. And go inside them. Then he says, therefore, the wisdom of God, God himself said, I will send them prophets and emissaries begging them to see the truth. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I've shared the gospel a ton of times. I mean, I don't share it as much anymore because I have a different role now. But I've shared it all over the world. Not too many people listen. No. No, you don't get great results. But you keep going. You know, like that story about that great evangelist in Indonesia. And the Lord sent him there for a year, and he would evangelize and evangelize, and they'd spit on him and make fun of him and throw things at him. And the little boy said, 
they're never going to listen to you. He said, I know. He said, why are you doing it? He said, I gave God my word. He said, well, why don't you just stay here and relax and chill and go back after a year? He said, well, at first I used to preach the gospel to change them. Now I preach it so they don't change me. They will kill some, persecute others. Imagine that. People come to you with the word of God. Their hearts are heavy for you. Hearts are heavy for you, crying over you. You persecute them. So that on this generation will fall the responsibility for all the prophet's blood that has been shed since the world was established. From the blood of Hevel, Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the holy place. Yes, I tell you, the responsibility of it will fall on this generation. Do you see what Yeshua is saying? Yeshua is confirming all 39 books of the Old Testament in these verses. Abel's death is found in the book of Genesis chapter 4. Zechariah's death is found in the book of Santa Chronicles chapter 24, the first and last books of the Hebrew Bible. So the next time you make an idiotic statement, like the law was nailed to the cross, understand that's about as stupid as the guy who says the Bible is written by men. Rabbi, but that's not what I was taught in my denomination. I really don't care what you were taught in your denomination. I'm kind of more interested in what the Bible says, and I think you should be too. Look at where the denominations are going, man. They're falling apart. They're making up their own rules. We're not a part of a denomination. Messianic Jewish Judaism is a movement. It's a prophetic movement. And I got news for you. Yes, I am under the MJ. But the day the MJ does something really stupid and against the word of God, I am out from under. This is the end of our Old Testament discussion. There was a guy, R. Laird Harris, he was born 1911. He lived 2008. He's very well known. He's church leader, Old Testament scholar, scholar of scholars, and the founder of the Covenant Theological Seminary. He wrote a book, Can I Trust My Bible? This is what he said. Quote, we can now be sure that the copyists worked with great care and accuracy on the Old Testament, even back to 225 B.C. Indeed, it would be rash skepticism, not just skepticism, Rash skepticism that would now deny that we have our Old Testament in a form very close to that used by Ezra when he taught the word of the Lord to those who had returned from the Babylonian captivity. The Old Testament's legit. And guess what? If I didn't even have the New Testament, I would know who the Messiah is. I wouldn't even need it. I have 333 prophetic messages. And guess what? That man known as Yeshua from Nazareth, fulfilled every single one of them. Let's move on to the New Testament now. How accurate is the New Testament? The composition of the New Testament was officially settled at the Council of Carthage in 397 AD. That's when they canonized the books that we read today, the 27 books. However, however, the majority of the New Testament was accepted as authoritative much earlier. They didn't wait till 397. The first collection of New Testament books was pr proposed by a man named, his last name is spelled M-A-R-C-I-O-N, in 140 A.D. Okay? Sadly enough, it's pronounced Martian, and you'll find out why it's very applicable. Martian was a docetist. You know what a docetist is? It's somebody who follows docetism. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a belief system that says all spirit is good. Gnosticism, all spirit is good, and all matter is evil. All material matter is evil. So Martian excluded any book that spoke of Yeshua being divine and human. The Gnostics believed that the spirit of the Lord fell upon Yeshua the man, and when he died, the spirit came off him before he died. So the Son of God really didn't die, just a man died. They're Gnostics. I'm telling you, don't mess with extracurricular books. Trust me, I know some of you, you have enough to study in God's Bible. There's enough. Okay? So Martian excluded any book that spoke of Yeshua being both divine and human, and he also edited some of Paul's letters to match his own philosophy, which is what we do today. It's called religion. He's no different. He was a religious guy. 
I'm going to fit it into my, I'm going to get the scriptures that fit. I believe in pre-tribulation rapture, so I'm going to highlight all the pre-tribulation. I believe in post-tribulation, so I'm going to highlight those. I believe in it. Not the way to do it. Doing it that way is putting your arrow in the wall and painting your target around and going, look, got a bullseye. It's not the way to do it. And we'll get into that probably the last week. But the next proposed collection, remember I said 397 in Carthage, of the New Testament was recorded by the Muratorian, Muratorian canon. And that dated 170 AD, way before 397. It included all four Gospels, 13 of Paul's letters, 1, 2, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. And it was ratified by the Council of Carthage, but it was put together 170. An actual manuscript was dis discovered by an Italian historian, Father Antonio Ludovico Muratori. That's where they get the Muratorian canon. In the Ambrosian Library in Milan, Italy, and it was published in 1740. But history shows that the actual New Testament in modern Bibles was recognized much earlier, much earlier. And that is an exact reflection of what the autographs, the originals contained. For example, Clement, around 95 AD, quotes from 11 of the New Testament books. 11. Ignatius, around 107 a AD, quotes from nearly every New Testament book. And Polycarp, which was John's direct disciple, Around 110 quotes from 17 of the New Testament books. In other words, using quotes from these men, the entire New Testament can be pieced together with the exception of 20 verses, most of them just from 3 John. Such evidence, guys, this is crazy evidence that we have these manuscripts that totally agree with what we read today. This is evidence that witnesses to the fact that the New Testament was recognized far earlier than the Council of Carthage in 397, and that the New Testament we have today is the same as what was written 2,000 years ago. I know some of you are like, who cares? That's sad. There is no literary rival in the ancient world to the number of manuscript copies and the early dating of the New Testament. No book or volumes of books can rival this evidence. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, handwritten copies that all agree. 5,300. We have 10,000 Latin manuscripts that all agree. We have 9,000 miscellaneous copies of the New Testament existing today, written in Syrian, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, and Ethiopic, some of which dates back to Jerome's translation in 384. We also have 13,000 copies of portions of the New Testament that has survived to our time. And guess what? More are being unearthed every day. Let me show you a picture of the Codex Vaticanus. This is legit. The Codex Vaticanus is the oldest extant manuscript, the oldest existing manuscript of the Greek Bible. The Codex is named after its place of conservation in the Vatican Library, where it has been kept since the 15th century. I think they should take it out every now and then and read it. <laughs> it is written on 759 leaves of vellum. Vellum is a prepared animal skin. They usually use calf skin. And in unical letters, those are unical letters. Unical letters are just a style of calligraphy written in a type of Latin. It's called scripto continua. And it means there are no gaps between the words. And it has been paleographically, fancy word, the study of ancient forms of writing for dating purposes, to the 4th century. This is from 300 AD. And when you translate this, it's exactly what you says that you're holding. Who's ever heard of this? Who's ever heard of this crazy evidence? Okay, you don't like the one in the Vatican, I get it. Let's go to the Codex, let's go to the Codex Sinaiticus, okay? We also have a Codex Sinaiticus, an Alexandrian text, manuscript written in unical letters on parchment dated between 330 and 360, and that's in London's British Library. These co two codices, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, are two exceptional parchment copies of the entire New Testament dating between 300 and 360 A.D., and by the way, again, I am not a scholar. This is nothing. This is scratching the surface. 
scratching the surface. Early is still. What? We have something earlier than this? Yes. Early is still. We have fragments and papyrus copies of portions of the New Testament that date between 180 and 225. The outstanding ones are the Chester BD papyrus, the Bodma papyrus 2, 14, and 15. From these manuscripts, not this one, can you go back a sec? From these manuscripts that I'm telling you about, the Chester BD and the Bodma, we can construct all the books of Luke, John, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Hebrews, and portions of Matthew, Mark, and Acts. 180. I know, this is unbelievable, right? This is like, man, what are you doing? I'm telling you, the next time you open up your Bible, kiss it. Now, there is a fragment we have from 130 AD. It's pretty cool. Now let's show that picture of the Rylance Papyrus. It's known as Rylance Papyrus P52. It's the oldest fragment we have. This is so cool, though. I'm, 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 I think this is cool. It was found in Egypt and has been paleographically dated to 130, okay? This find, though, forces critics to place the fourth gospel, John, into the first century, abandoning their earliest assertion that it could not have been written by the Apostle John. <sighs> they make these, these assertions, you know? It's like, it's like they can't handle that, that the causeless cause created the earth. They come down to these idiot statements, like it came out of an egg, or two oceans got together and had intercourse, or a single cell theory. You're intelligent? You men, you should be put away. The Rylands Papyrus is on display at John Rylands University in Manchester, UK. You can see it. It contained the following verses from John's Gospel, chapter 18. Listen to this. This is beautiful. Let's take a look at the verses that it contained. Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your own law. The Judeans replied, we don't have the legal power to put anyone to death. This was so that what Yeshua had said about how he was going to die might be fulfilled. They could stone, but he prophesied that he was going to be crucified. So Pilate went back into the headquarters, called Yeshua and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? So then Pilate said to him, you are king after all? Yeshua answered, you say I'm the king. The reason I've been born, the reason I've come into this world is to bear witness to the truth. You ever want to know? There's your answer. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Having said this, Pilate went outside again to the Judeans and told them, I don't find any case against them. Now, before we break this down, let me just tell you something. When you read your Bible and you don't read things for external evidence, you think, oh, Pilate was this meek, weak, and he was being bossed around by the Jews. Rome persecuted all the Jews. They ran the show. Pilate was so evil, he killed he killed people when they were sacrificing and mixed their blood with the sacrificial blood. He killed family members. He killed ex-wives. They had to pull him out of Judea because he was so evil. He hated being there. You know what I mean? If you're going to serve, like if you're a priest, you want to be a cardinal in, in Italy. You don't want to be a make in Georgia. So he was in this disgusting place called Judea. He's like, bring me to Italy, man. They had to pull him out. He was so evil. Do a little study on Pilate. Okay? It's not like the Jews ran him. He ran the show. And he just washed his hands of it and had a scapegoat. Now, we're certain of the Jews want him crucified? Yes. All of the Jews? Read your Bible, Acts 4.27. In this place, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and some of the Jews conspired to kill this Jesus. Okay, let's break this down real quick and then I'll get you out of here. John 18, 31, 33, Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your own law. Meaning, look, I, I could care less about this guy. I care less. He's nothing to me. Just, I don't, I don't even know what he did, but just, just have at it. You know, get rid of him. But the sick thing is that 
these verses that were found in one, one, these verses from 130 AD, they talk about the truth, the truth about God, the truth about his Messiah, the truth about man and sin and salvation. That's what we're reading right here, man. Pilate tried to evade responsibility and throw it back to the Judeans. Pilate takes Yeshua into the Praetorium for a private interview. Ah, let's see what this guy's about. What's the, big, what's the big hoopla? Why is everybody going crazy over this guy? He's like a nobody, a nothing. So Pilate questions to determine whether Yeshua was a threat to Rome's imperial power. Okay? In other words, Rome could care less about condemning someone about a religious crime. They weren't religious. They were a bunch of atheists. They don't care. Oh, 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 oh he, he went against the Jewish law. What do I care? I don't care about your law. I don't care about you. Or blasphemy? He claims to be God? Who cares? Whatever. He's nuts. Get him out of here. But is he a threat to Rome's imperial power? That's all he cares about. That's what evil dictators care about. Is there going to be an insurrection? Then in 37, 38, this is crazy. You got it? So then, Pilate said to him, you are a king? <laughs> You're a king? Look at you. You're in rags. You're tatted. You're no Caesar, buddy. Some poor Jewish guy? They want to kill for what? Who cares? You're a king? So Yeshua, typical Jewish sarcasm. Oh, you said I'm a king? You admit it? Is that right? Like who told you? Did you figure that out on your own? Somebody told you I'm a king. It's not even panicking knowing that he's going to be murdered. Horrifically, he says, let me tell you something, pal. The reason I was born. In other words, I don't fight with conventional weapons. I can call down uh, 72,000 angels to burn your eyes out in your head. He goes, I'm here for a different purpose. You don't understand. My, my kingdom isn't of this world. If I take you out, what do I accomplish? But if I let them take me out, look at what we got. The reason I have been born... The very reason I came, the very reason the word of God put on flesh was to bear witness to the truth. So when you think truth isn't important, you're crazy. It's all important. You have grace without truth. You have nothing. That's why we need the grace, because we messed up on the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. In other words, do you belong to the truth? Do you, do you know who I am? I guess not. Pilate asked him, what, what is the truth? What is the truth? Isn't it ironic that the one who is charged, Pilate, with determining the truth in the matter glibly dismisses the relevance of truth and the very presence of the one who is truth incarnate? I said ironic. I should really say moronic. Was Pilate puzzled? I don't know. Was he sarcastic? I don't know. Was he interested? I don't know. But I do know this. Truth incarnate stood before him and he didn't recognize him. Last but not least, let me show you one chart. This is an important chart to have. I'm showing you John's gospel. I'm comparing it to Herodotus's histories. Herodotus' histories is considered the founding work of history in the Western literature. This is the author's lifespan, John and Herodotus. This is the date of the events. This is the date of the actual writing. This is the earliest copy from the original. This is the lapse of the event to writing, and you can find this on the internet. And this is the lapse of the event to the manuscript. We hold Herodotus' histories in the highest regard and the lapse of event to the manuscript is 1,400 years. And we completely honor it and respect it. Why? Because we're idiots. Oh, no, let me rephrase that. Because the devil is good at what he does. How's that? Let's give him credit. He deserves it. He's really good at deception. Let me give you two quotes. Sir Frederick Kenyon, and we'll end with this. He lived 1863 to 1952. He's a paleographer. He's an expert in ancient handwriting. He is, he's the guy. 
He wrote the book on the subject called The Bible and Archaeology. Listen to his quote. The interval then between the dates of the original composition and the earliest actual evidence of the New Testament becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to as substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the Old Testament may be regarded as finally established, period. And a great book that was called the New Testament in Original Greek it was written by Brooke Foss Westcott, 1825 to 1901, a British bishop, biblical scholar, and Fenton John Anthony Hort, 1828 to 1892, Irish-born theologian. It only took them 28 years to write this book. And that was working on it daily. 28 years. That's a lot of scholarship. Okay? This is what they said. If comparative trivialities, such as changes in order, the insertion or omission of the article with proper names, and the like are set aside, meaning negligible differences, the works, in our opinion, still subject to doubt, can hardly mount to more than a thousandth part of the New Testament. In other words... The small changes and variations in manuscript change no major doctrine. They do not affect Christianity in the least. The message is the same with or without the variation. We have the word of God, period. Stand up. I will admit to you, sometimes scholarship can be a little boring. Again, I am the furthest thing from a scholar. I have dyslexia, I have, I'm ADHD, I have ADD, so it, I cannot read. The only thing I could read is the Bible because when I read it, somehow miraculously I see pictures. Otherwise, I cannot read. If you give me an article, some of you have given me books and I, I don't read them because I can't. And it's not to make you go, oh, what was he? What was nothing? I see the Bible in pictures, man. I'm happy. I didn't get cursed, I got blessed. God took what was bad and turned something good out of it, so this isn't to get you to feel sorry for me, you know? This way I don't even have to listen to you, and I can just go, hey, it's ADD. <laughs> um, but, but the next two weeks is my bread and butter, because every history book has this internal and external bibliographical evidence, but our history book, which is really his story, has prophetic, there's a prophetic aspect that no other book or volumes of books can rival. And as far as people like Nostradamus, they were general fortune cookie prophecies that don't amount to squat. Okay, but ours are detailed to the day Yeshua would walk into Jerusalem. Nisan 10, the day. So, so if you're not big on scholarship, I'm going to spin your head with prophecy over the next two weeks. And then we're going to finish this thing up on the sixth week and neatly wrap it up, and then I'm out of here. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Oh, and next week, Sunday, Shavuot. So we double dip next weekend, okay? Shabbat Shalom.